hello to attendees. Uh, hello, people. Thank you for following us and thank you, Mari, for joining us. Uh, we are having a webinar tonight on the topic of Council of Europe gender policies. And uh, this is uh, uh, made uh, in the scope of project that is organized by Green European Foundation uh, with the support of CDN and uh, financial support of the European Parliament to the Green European Foundation and with the support of European Youth Foundation of Council of Europe. And uh, we are having uh, Mari as our guest uh, tonight. Um, Mari is, I'm hope, I hope I'm, in, <laughs> I'm spelling this okay. I'm pronouncing this okay. Um, so <laughs> Mari is a, a queer feminist activist from Georgia. Uh, she has been involved at different local queer feminist activist groups and initiatives for around 10 years. She is one of the founders of Hurum Nights, a queer party series that started in 2016 and Lesbian Resistance, a non-hierarchical queer feminist initiative that aims to rethink forms of resistance that have been dominated by NGO structures in Georgia. Uh, Marie is a human rights lawyer and has been engaged with different LGBTQI NGOs locally and internationally. She has been a chair of the board of Equality Movement, the largest LGBTQI organization in Georgia for four years, and also a member of the board of IGLYO. Currently, she is a gender uh, report too at the Council of Europe's Advisory Council on Youth and also works as a strategic litigation lawyer for International Partnership for Human Rights. Uh, sorry if I botched some words uh, and excuse my English pronunciation. Uh, Mari, I would give you the floor now and uh, yeah, you can uh, kick off. <laughs> Thanks, thanks a lot uh, for introducing me. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be here and uh, spending this evening together with you. Um, and uh, thanks for the introduction. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I'm Mari and um, yeah, I use uh, pronouns both um, she and they. Uh, and I, I identify as um, gender fluid person as most of the time I'm not sure or willing uh, to fit uh, those binary categories. Uh, sometimes I uh, choose to um, uh, choose um, my struggles depending to the context uh, and uh, use strategic essentialism. I'm, I'm saying this because I think it's important. Um, uh, so yes, and um, so today we're going to be talking about the Council of Europe uh, and gender policies and also use, uh, and I'm going to share my perspectives. So it's going to be from my point of view. Um, it's very important also to mention that mostly, uh, as I see myself, I'm a grassroots uh, activist. Uh, so I'm not the one who is who has been really engaged for long at the Council of Europe. I came there and I started to be part of the Council of Europe from uh, from like from my activism, from my grassroots Georgian activism, uh, where I was involved in mostly non-formal groups. But um, as an uh, as an activist, I deploy different methods, different different forms of activism because I believe that uh, all of them some of them more, some of them less are very important. I think we will have time to uh, discuss uh, at the end of uh, this session, how we see uh, ourselves or uh, how we see Council of Europe or different platforms uh, to, uh, to really fight for change um, 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 and for more equal world or, you know, uh, so, uh, yes, and um, so I prepared a presentation about the Council of Europe um, and um, gender and youth there. Um, so I also have this PowerPoint presentation. I want to start by showing it because, well, I was thinking, uh, and since I don't know the audience and it's going to be on Facebook, I didn't want to assume uh, that um, all of them know what we are talking about, the organization, etc. So I started to, uh, to cover some, some of the very basic um, stuff and to be um, as simple as possible because I believe that simplicity is the, the best way, uh, best approach uh, to the things. Um, so I'm gonna 
uh, start now. And I hope that we will have um, then more time to discuss some of the questions and I will be very happy to uh, answer. Um, so one minute, let me share my screen. Is it there? Okay. Um, so we're talking about the Council of Europe, uh, which is uh, the regional organization, intergovernmental organization, I would say one of the most important uh, in Europe. Uh, it unites 47 European uh, states. Um, and um, yes, uh, I, I want to now talk about uh, some of the main bodies and structures uh, that are under the Council of Europe. So we have the better idea uh, how it works. So this is Secretary General um, uh, Maria Buric. Uh, so Secretary General um, uh, is a position that is elected uh, by the Parliamentary Assembly for a five years uh, term. Uh, and so she's uh, responsible for the overall management of the organization. So I would say one of the most important or the most important person. Uh, this time it is uh, a woman. Um, uh, in total, um, uh, as I went through, there have been 14 secretary generals and only two have been uh, uh, women. I think that's also very important to have our uh, gender perspective there. Um, and she's been, uh, she was elected in 2019. And um, uh, then um, another uh, position is uh, Deputy Secretary General. Uh, this time it's Gabriela Giagoni, who was re-elected um, for the second time uh, in 2015. Uh, she was elected uh, by the Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, uh, and there's, there are two separate elections, one for the Secretary General and another for Deputy Secretary General. Uh, then one of the most important bodies at the Council of Europe, uh, it's a Committee of Ministers. So this is the Council's decision-making body. Uh, and it is made up of ministers of foreign affairs uh, and also um, the permanent representatives. Uh, so the Committee of Ministers decides the Council of Europe's policy and approves its budgets and programs. So the major decision-making body and um, well, it uh, meets uh, differently. So at ministerial level, it happens once a year but at deputies level, it's, uh, it's a weekly meetings. And so ministers, deputies are assigned by bureau, are assisted. So they are assisted by bureau, rapporteur groups, thematic coordinators and um, uh, ad hoc uh, parties. Apart from committee of ministers, we have another um, uh, important uh, body, which is uh, parliamentary assembly. Sorry, I think I just... Uh, yeah, sorry for the mistake. <laughs> there is a photo that shouldn't be here. So Parliamentary Assembly, uh, called also PACE, um, uh, is um, a body which, is, uh, which consists of uh, parliamentarians from all 47 countries, and there are 324 uh, members. Uh, so they meet four times a year to discuss some topical issues and they adopt uh, different uh, documents. Uh, some of them are recommendations, resolutions, opinions, um, etc. Uh, and there are very important yeah, political debates uh, at, at the parliament. Um, so like to improve lives of um, European people. Uh, then uh, we have um, European Court of Human Rights. This is my um, favorite body, I would say, because I had to deal with that uh, in my professional capacity uh, mostly. Uh, so uh, European Court of Human Rights, lots of um, lawyers believe that uh, is one of the most effective human rights mechanism uh, in the world um, uh, because, uh, because it has um, strong enforcement uh, mechanisms, um, but we can also debate that uh, as there are also lots of um, uh, obstacles um, to its effectiveness as well. So European Court of Human Rights um, was established under the Council of Europe um, and all 47 member states 
who are also signatories of the European Convention of Human Rights are bind by this convention uh, and um, they can be taken before the Court of um, European Court of Human Rights in case they breach the convention. So the European Co Convention on uh, Human Rights basically mostly it's a binding document that covers civil and political rights. It's a binding document that establishes basic uh, fundamental freedoms uh, and rights. Uh, um, uh, and then the court uh, interprets uh, and um, as, it, uh, as it perceives the European uh, Convention on Human Rights uh, as a living instrument and always interprets and tries to inter interpret it according uh, to the current circumstances. Uh, I think that's a very long topic uh, to talk about the um, uh, Convention and the human rights, but so um, most important is to say that they establish the human rights standards that are um, that has uh, that have binding force upon the member states, but also this case law generally established the human rights framework um, that is very important to all of us. Um, and the um, judges um, uh, that are at the European Court of Human Rights, so there are 47 judges, and this number equals to the countries presented there. So, um, and they are elected by the parliamentary assembly. Uh, so uh, each member state there um, uh, nominates three candidates and then parliamentary assembly um, elects one from those three candidates and uh, they serve for a uh, nine uh, term, nine years, nine years uh, there um, at the court. Uh, and uh, so it's important to know that judges are obliged to um, act in their individual capacity. So they should not have any um, institutional or similar ties to their member states, etc. So they should be completely impartial while deciding upon uh, the cases. Uh, and then uh, when the decision is uh, made by the European Court of Human Rights, uh, Committee of Ministers uh, is a body that uh, oversees its um, um, execution and its enforcement. Uh, as I've mentioned already, even though these decisions are binding and um, the member states are obliged to um, implement uh, uh, the judgment, uh, there have been problems uh, with um, with countries not always uh, in, in a timely manner following those decisions, especially some of the countries such as uh, Russia or Turkey, uh, Azerbaijan, etc., who have been um, not so effective uh, in enforcement uh, of those judgments. And generally, uh, this can be a very scary thing because then if there is no political will and if those countries are not implementing the judgment, that the whole uh, strength and whole credibility or the sense of this um, judicial body uh, comes under threat. Um, so, yep. Uh, then uh, to mention also Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, uh, she was uh, elected also um, uh, so in 2018, uh, and um, uh, this is uh, also Commissioner for Human Rights tries to promote human rights through different uh, like um, activities and ways, but mainly through thematic reports, but country visits as well. And generally the role is to promote human rights, um, uh, human rights education and awareness um, through different um, uh, means. Uh, uh, this time it is Dunia Mijatovic, and I'm also sure that I didn't pronounce it correctly. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, uh, and uh, so she, she was the first uh, commissioner for human rights in this role. Um, now uh, let's uh, move uh, to the topic of gender and what gender, uh, what role gender plays at the Council of Europe. I would say that um, gender equality has become one, one of the most, um, I would say discussed and also um, uh, yeah, discuss topics uh, at the Council of Europe uh, and lots of uh, attention is devoted to gender. Uh, at the outset, uh, I have to mention somehow that 
Of course, gender is understood in binary terms. That is uh, problematic. Um, uh, so when uh, when they talk about gender, they mean men and um, women, uh, and so all the other, the whole spectrum is not uh, always, uh, uh, if ever, discussed. So I think that this is something that we need to work um, harder. Uh, but at this point, yes, uh, when we talk about gender equality, it's about uh, somehow trying to achieve equality between two established genders. Um, uh, and well, um, Council of Europe, uh, the main document uh, that uh, this um, the Council of Europe follows uh, in terms of gender equality is a strategy, and it is the second time uh, that uh, they have adopted. First time it was in 2014. Um, there was a three-year strategy, uh, gender equality strategy, and then in 2000, uh, the, the second one is for uh, 2008, uh, 18 until 2000. Uh, 23 when it covers this period. Um, so, um, and um, there are different bodies uh, at the Council of Europe that try to touch upon uh, um, or enhance uh, gender equality, gender equality related issues, etc. One of the important bodies uh, is uh, Gender Equality Commission. So it is an intergovernmental body. Uh, and it consists uh, consists with the representatives from the member states. So Gender Equality Commission was established uh, to help ensure the mainstreaming of gender equality into all Council of Europe policies and to bridge the gap between commitments made at international level and the reality of women in Europe. Uh, and the members are appointed, as I've mentioned, by member states. So, and the, they are the ones who provide uh, advice, guidance, and support to other Council of Europe bodies. Uh, and uh, of course, the main guiding document for them is uh, gender strategy. And uh, they are tasked to um, support the implementation of um, those objectives that are um, established by this. Uh, gender equality strategy. Um, then there is gender equality division. So when we spoke uh, about uh, earlier commission, it was intergovernmental body. Uh, and division uh, is um, uh, more, um, um, it consists of staff members. So these are those people who work at the Council of Europe uh, and they provide, uh, they are kind of a, a secretary, secretariat uh, that they try to provide very, um, how to say, practical assistance. Um, uh, and uh, mostly what they do is uh, they try to uh, build capacity uh, and implement different projects uh, with the gender equality perspective. For example, they support um, uh, a lot gender equality rapporteurs, they can carry out trainings, they publish different documents. Um, so yeah, they carry out everyday tasks uh, at the Council of Europe uh, in that uh, regard. And uh, now to talk a little bit about gender equality rapporteurs uh, and also about my role uh, as a gender equality rapporteur at the Council of Europe. Uh, so gender equality rapporteurs are uh, people uh, that are appointed uh, at different bodies. Uh, it can be steering committees, monitoring bodies and other intergovernmental structures uh, at the Council of Europe. And the main role is to mainstream gender um, uh, at all levels. Uh, so basically there are 14 people, uh, 40 uh, gender equality rapporteurs. Um, I am uh, part of uh, the Joint Council on Use. Uh, but uh, I will also talk about it later. But the main main role for us is to be there, uh, to be there uh, at different bodies, but to be sure that whenever whatever is discussed, to have our gender glasses on, to put our gender glasses, and just raise some of the questions um, that are very uh, gender sensitive, and ask question, for example, uh, if whatever we're discussing differently affects um, men and women, 
um, or if uh, whatever the initiative is uh, discussed re uh, retains, I mean, the status quo as it is, or if it affects then gender equality in a bad way. So it's basically trying to understand whatever the discussion is uh, going through, if the, if the gender perspective is there. Um, and I think that it's very important uh, to have these people around because at different levels, they are trying to, um, to bring those, those vision there. Um, and use department now. Um, I think it's, um, uh, it's uh, probably, it should be um, very important to young people. So um, Council of Europe has its youth department um, and um, it's a part of the Directorate of Democratic Participation. <laughs> and uh, um, so the department uh, elaborates different programs, um, guidelines, uh, instruments, and then uh, tries to um, uh, implement effective policies that have youth perspective in there uh, at different levels. And also it provides Funding to different um, uh, youth activities uh, and initiatives. Um, and uh, there are people, staff members of Council of Europe who, are, uh, who work at youth department uh, and uh, manage all the, all the work that are, uh, that, that are, that are regarding the uh, youth. Uh, I don't know if you have heard, but European uh, Youth Foundation is a body under the Council of Europe under the youth department uh, that uh, funds uh, youth organizations and different initiatives and annual budget that it has is uh, 3.7 million. Um, now I would like to talk about uh, co-management system that I believe is a very good uh, uh, example of how young people can participate uh, in decision making and actually be part of it. So uh, at the Council of Europe, um, uh, there are um, uh, statutory bodies, um, which is um, the European Steering Committee for Youth uh, Advisory Council. And then when these two bodies work together, they come together as a joint council on youth. Uh, and uh, I would like to talk um, now about these uh, statutory bodies. So the European Steering Committee uh, for Youth, uh, CDEJ, um, this brings together representatives uh, of ministries or bodies that are responsible for youth matters from, uh, in this case, 50 um, uh, states uh, who are um, who have signed the European Cultural Convention. So not 47, but 50. Uh, so this, uh, this body is uh, intergovernmental. It unites uh, representatives of uh, governments who are in charge of uh, um, use uh, issues at uh, local level. And um, so this, um, this body, CDJ, fosters cooperation between governments in the youth sector and provides a framework for comparing national youth policies, exchanging ideas, uh, practices, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and then here we go. This is advisory council on youth. Uh, 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 and uh, these are um, 30 young people uh, who are either elected um, or um, so there, uh, let me tell you how this happens actually. So uh, there is this organization, the European Youth Forum, um, which is one of the largest uh, youth organization, umbrella organization in Europe. It unites um, uh, around 100 organizations if uh, um, I'm correct. Um, and uh, so this forum, European Youth Forum, uh, chooses um, uh, uh, during, like, uh, chooses and um, elects representatives who then gonna be, uh, who representing uh, different organizations or national news councils uh, uh, at the advisory council on use. And, um, part of the advisory council uh, is then, um, 
through the applications uh, appointed. So there are 30 representatives from different international NGOs or national youth councils um, that are that uh, come together uh, to make sure that uh, young people's voices are heard basically at the Council of uh, Europe. Uh, and then together uh, they uh, come uh, together with the, uh, the joint steering committee uh, and work together. So basically how it works is uh, advisory council and then um, steering committee uh, together uh, meet each other and decide upon the strategies and um, upon the most important decisions that concern um, youth uh, and then decide. Uh, um, so they, I would say that they are the most important decision-making body, policy-making body uh, at the Council of Europe. Uh, and um, they decide on the budget, on the major strategies, uh, uh, that the Council of Europe has uh, regarding the uh, use, basically. So, at, um, and uh, the Joint Council uh, works in three major uh, directions. So, there are three priorities. Uh, um, this is access to rights, use participation, and use work and inclusive and peaceful societies. So the how the work uh, is organized at the um, advisory council is that these 30 representatives are then assigned to different portfolios. Uh, so different according to their interests and uh, expertise and knowledge. And during their mandate, that is two years, they uh, work on these portfolios. Uh, and also uh, apart from these portfolios, um, Advisory Council has rapporteurs. Um, we have rapporteurs on Roma, rapporteurs on disability issues uh, and gender equality rapporteur, um, which is me. Uh, so our role is uh, to bring up uh, this uh, very, uh, in this case, in my case, gender perspective. While, while we discuss different issues and try to make sure that uh, uh, those uh, priorities or policies or uh, just simply activities uh, that we carry out um, have this perspective um, in mind. Uh, so this was uh, just uh, me talking about uh, the bodies um, uh, and uh, how it works, uh, etc. I'll just now finish this presentation and then we'll be back in my screen. How should I do this? One minute. Stop sharing. Yeah, you should have uh, where you shared the screen. I think also there it should be like stop sharing. Let me see if I can also Okay, let's see. Uh, there is only resume share. I don't know. Uh, am I still? Uh, can you see me on my face, or is still the presentation on screen, or what? 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 <laughs> okay. Did I, okay. okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So now to continue talking um, uh, about uh, how I see um, the work uh, there that is done. Um, on gender or on youth issues. Um, so I think that, um, so first of all, as I already mentioned, it's very important that uh, the young people are able to be part of the Council of Europe. And I also believe that it's, uh, uh, this process is uh, participatory in a way that um, those people who are engaged in different local or international NGOs can be elected, can put forward their candidacy. Uh, and that's a, that's definitely a good practice. But what should be, we bear in mind is that, okay, I'm coming from Georgia um, uh, and I'm also a queer person. Um, and unfortunately, when we talk about uh, uh, representation and who gets to speak and uh, uh, how easy we get to speak and how easy we manage to uh, reach uh, different institutions and organizations, 
we should always keep in mind the privileges that we have, uh, privilege of being able to speak English or privilege of being able to have that education. So there are lots of um, lots of barriers uh, that a um, young person might face. And because of different the structural inequalities that we um, differently have, uh, and the inequalities that constantly intersect, we we are able only very differently to use this, uh, you know, like privilege and access. And um, sometimes, uh, not sometimes, always, it's important to really be critical. Uh, who who are those uh, people there? Uh, 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 is it too Western centric? Who are uh, those people who are elected? Uh, from what economic background do they come from? What what uh, ethnic background do they come from? Uh, and uh, of course, this kind of um, question should be there. Uh, what I've experienced is that, um, yeah, because of these uh, very different circumstances that we've been raised and operating, um, this is not so easy for everyone. Uh, this is the one point uh, that I wanted to say. And also language barrier means a lot. Uh, if you don't speak uh, proper English, you sometimes, uh, of course, with very basic things, are very restricted to, you know, just face your voice or being, you know, up there loud. It's very like basic sometimes that really hinders lo uh, lots of us uh, to participate at regional levels, uh, being it um, intergovernmental or non-governmental. Um, also, then when we talk about the Council of Europe, um, we should know what kind of organization it is and what, what kind of platform it is, because um, it is, uh, there are lots of um, uh, limitations to what you can and what you cannot. Uh, coming from, uh, from, uh, from, from those backgrounds where you where you really want to smash everything or you're angry uh, like a radical um, activist and then you go there and see that um, uh, this anger, this rage or the very radical forms that you might have as an as an activist uh, who operates um, mostly you know, in non-formal, uh, groups, uh, sometimes uh, in NGOs, local NGOs, but grassroots, uh, it's completely different situation. And then when you're there, of course, you realize that this is a completely different platform where things work very differently and uh, you have to very often reframe, uh, reframe uh, what you want to say, how you want to say in order to be heard, but also um, it's a collective body. So when, when you're there, for example, at, at the advisory council or generally at the joint council, when you're sitting with uh, state representatives who come from very different backgrounds, then you see that uh, you have to go um, with, I mean, you have to do lots of compromises. Uh, and then somehow this is, um, this is, uh, in a way, uh, it can be uh, challenging and complicated because uh, all of us together somehow uh, have to agree on something and uh, like find compromises. And this process takes uh, lots of time, lots of energy, sometimes lots of frustration. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, I was just trying to say that uh, context matters uh, and uh, the platform matters a lot. And uh, depending what our aim is, and also depending on the circumstances and the platform we're talking about, our uh, tools are very different. And then it's about us uh, really choosing the tools, um, which tools we use and how, and just having this, these limitations in mind. I don't wanna say that uh, it's totally like, not effective. I do believe that we need to use all these platforms. We need to reach them. We need to penetrate the system uh, uh, all like at all its levels. Uh, but then uh, the, this kind of um, frustration always is there, um, um, of course. Uh, I see that some questions are coming. Should I? Uh, but I did not manage to read the questions. 
Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for growing, going through all these different bodies. Um, yeah, thank you for presentation. Um, we have one question for now. Uh, and sure, like you can answer this and I will also check if uh, on Facebook we have some audience asking questions. So uh, how can young people uh, participate in these structures? Um, young people can uh, use different ways. Um, um, so um, one way, as I mentioned, is to get engaged uh, in different um, organizations, uh, youth organizations, uh, become their members, uh, be active participant, and then also find ways to get engaged at regional levels, meet uh, uh, different uh, young uh, activists from different countries. And then, um, of course, there's a lot way because at first, like I'm sharing my personal perspective, I was uh, elected uh, as, at a board um, of LGBTQA organization in Georgia. Um, and then equality movement, the, this is LGBTQA, um, uh, NGO uh, in Georgia, they sent me as a representative at IGLIO. Uh, IGLIO is regional LGBTQ organization. And then I had to be elected at IGLIO and then I became board member at IGLIO. And then IGLIO sent me at the European Youth Forum um, uh, where I had to also be elected, uh, uh, in order, so elected in order to become member of advisory council. And then at advisory council, I had to be elected as a gender equality operator. This can be, what I'm saying is that it requires um, a lot of uh, resources, emotional resources, time, uh, physical, uh, etc. Uh, but so this is the, the, the way. Um, I would say start by just uh, reaching out to organizations uh, that are locally and then finding ways how to get engaged with regional organizations and also this was one way but as I said that for example if we want to like structurally engage at the uh, advisory council at the Council of Europe as a young person, you can send there an application uh, because some of the members were not elected by the European News Forum, but was selected. So the, by their resumes and motivation letters, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and there are, there are always lots of different calls uh, and trainings and uh, seminars. And uh, these are the ways where we, of, of course, uh, I don't know, meet like can my people. So this is one way, but another way of engaging is really, um, and I, I, I will now recall one example, for example. Um, so there was this critical uh, moment at the Council of Europe uh, when, the Rush, when Russia was um, going to pull out. So we throw, uh, and that was this critical moment when uh, uh, the budget of the Council of Europe has to be resought. And there was um, uh, this moment when the youth department uh, was um, threatened in a way to, you know, cut it, cut in uh, short with budget and uh, this, um, Everything was at stake anyway. So because uh, when there was this critical uh, situation, they decided to, of course, uh, let's uh, uh, cut uh, short uh, youth department, young people. And what we did was uh, we tried to mobilize a lot uh, through social media. Uh, we, we tried to mobilize the national uh, youth councils. We tried to reach out our representatives, permanent representatives at the Council of Europe. We tried to reach everyone uh, we could uh, and then started the campaign uh, against it. So, um, and uh, well, as they say, it in a way worked. So uh, just being there, um, sometimes not really directly in uh, being involved in these structures, but also just pushing uh, as an independent activist or as, uh, as part of the grassroots movement is a way of engagement uh, and uh, just being critical uh, or, uh, you know, like is also, this is what I wanted to say. 
Yeah. And I have other two questions. Uh, yeah. What are your recommendations for the young people that are doing reactionary activism and don't see point in traditional politics on various bodies? Uh, do you think there can be anything done to avoid the risk of cutting use the part? Okay, this is another question. So what are the recommendations uh, for the young people that are doing re reactionary activism? Mm. That's in a way me also. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, it can be, you can be both. Uh, you can be a person who uh, is very, how to say, nihilistic in a way, uh, very pessimistic or in a way very critical, not seeing, but sometimes seeing, or sometimes think very little, but still trying. Sometimes think a lot more in different forms of activism, but still being here and pushing because you see that if not you, then, I mean, this sounds very cliche or something, but uh, um, sometimes uh, you, you reach there and you think that you have to do it because, um, because you have this anger and, and maybe that's the best place to somehow put it even though in a very moderate way or even though in very different ways than you would, would expect or then your expectations, but still you're there and then you're just using whatever is at your disposal. What I would uh, recommend, <laughs> I mean, um, to be honest, um, uh, and now I'm like speaking in a very honest way, I don't believe that uh, for most of us, uh, there, there is time to wait. I don't believe that we have lots of time to wait, and especially in this crisis, uh, um, when we see that uh, the system has failed us, and now when there is this pandemic, we see every day that uh, the most vulnerable people's lives are um, literally, you know, we, we are uh, losing. Um, and when, and then we see that the whole system, this capitalistic uh, neoliberal system, uh, patriarchy, um, and this uh, unequal distribution of resources and everything. I mean, uh, of course, uh, you can't stay calm, especially when you're young and have not been really disciplined yet uh, to that extent when you know um, <laughs> when you become part of the system uh, um, so i really see uh, uh, lots of uh, and even more uh, more use uh, in being radical uh, and not really going into the structures because after a while you might discover that you've been disciplined that your uh, voice your tone has been lowered uh, that maybe you are get used to what's being offered and then you believe that oh step by step I'm still achieving and that's it um, there has there has to be someone maybe doing this kind of job as well but we really need um, angry young people who will not take um, whatever is offered um, uh, is enough uh, and I've, I've seen uh, like uh, looking myself um, how how easy it is in a way to become part of the structure and then start thinking as a structure. And then when so many people are telling you that, oh, you know what, this is how the system works there. And if you want to get through something, then this is the ways that we do it. And then you might find yourself alone um, uh, or sometimes with only few people who are uh, frustrated in the same manner as you're frustrated. And um, of course, there is very existential, existential questions, uh, of course, like, uh, uh, where do I see myself? Uh, am I losing my time? Uh, is, there, is this a place for me to be? And these are the very personal questions, to be honest, to ask to ourselves. Um, is it worth it for us, personally? Uh, do we think that um, the very limited uh, resources that we have uh, should be spent there or there because activism and change can be done in very different ways. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's just a matter where, where we see ourselves. Mm. Uh, 
but also, I mean, another very important issue to just uh, uh, touch uh, upon that that I see is very common is uh, this um, how to say depression, burnout, and uh, loss of hope uh, that I've seen also in young activists who've been engaged in this struggle for for years, uh, and then. Um, you know, at some point you realize that you're so tired of everything <laughs> um, uh, that you completely forget self-care. Uh, you completely uh, forget that you deserve uh, as a person, as an activist, this bits of uh, uh, joy here and there. So um, what I would recommend to, uh, to young activists, maybe the most important is that Remember that uh, in this world, uh, self-care can also be a form of resistance. Uh, and um, especially if, you, if you're a queer person, if you're women, if you're coming from a uh, disadvantaged background and then you're uh, using all your resources to fight uh, this structural inequality, then of course you're putting yourself out there, but then um, completely forgetting yourself in this fight, uh, it might not be uh, fair towards yourself. So while choosing the battles, while choosing the, the forms and the um, uh, forms uh, that you use, uh, it's very uh, yeah, important to have all, all this in mind because well, I've been engaged in different forms of activism since I was 19 and I'm 29 and uh, I've faced very um, severe uh, depressions uh, on my way and it's very difficult to recover. Once you get there at the bottom, bottom then um, I don't believe that it can be ever you know, you can't really fully recover from this, especially if you're testing different grounds for your activism and you're testing different uh, grounds, um, you know, like, uh, to bring uh, social change. So, um, like, really uh, think about your resources that you have as a person, not to sacrifice totally, because, come on, I mean, you are important. Uh, every each of us. Uh, uh, is important so yep um so should i also do you think there can be anything done to avoid the risk of cutting use department budget uh, in the future um i think um yeah th this is um how to say um communal effort like it's a, it's an effort that uh, young people should put into this uh, okay i'm gonna also like, now speak from my personal uh, experience uh, from where i'm coming from um, I, i've been involved in uh, different for example in lgbtqi activism i've been involved in uh, like feminist uh, movements and uh, what i've seen there is that the the the, the issue of uh, use as such was not there you know what i mean sometimes you sometimes young people don't realize that age can be a barrier actually a ground for discrimination because we also pretty much normalize the situation as it is we sometimes take it as I, i've been in lots of situations where just because i'm young i'm not taken seriously or where i myself not not taking myself seriously because i know that well i am i am among those experienced people they know more they know better um and uh, you know like have, i was the one who really uh, and we are raised like this to know that elderly people are the ones who know more, uh, uh, who know better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we, in different situations, when we come together as an activist or in a group, uh, like we see that there is a domination of certain certain people, and uh, age is one of the factor. If we see different groups, uh, like in uh, LGBTQI 
movements i've seen that it's dominated by uh, cis male cis gay men who are in their 40s let's say so like in the uh, you know mid ages etc and then uh, also the same goes with feminist movements where like uh, voices of young activists was not, I, and i'm coming from my personal perspective i don't i can't really say uh, how it is everywhere but this is something um, uh, to realize that uh, uh, young people, uh, first of all, need to realize that uh, the situations and uh, that they appear to be where they feel that they are not treated in the same way as those people who are old, like uh, more experienced and older, it's not normal and it's not okay. Just because we have, I don't know, we have lived less amount of years doesn't mean that we might not be uh, better experts in something or it, it doesn't mean that we might not have, um, uh, you know, more uh, knowledge in certain issues because it's very contextual and it really, uh, you know, depends on, um, yeah, on the context. So um, I, I answered this question from a very broad uh, uh, angle, but um, yes, young people uh, as the youth department at the Council of Europe in that case was regarded as something that could be, uh, you know, cut short. Uh, this is all this showed their attitudes, uh, but then, um, if we maybe stay louder, uh, stay angry, and uh, uh, get to get to them and say that look, you are dealing with something that's very soon gonna be our reality. This is already our reality, but also like our future. You cannot take decisions about our future without us having there. You can't uh, take decisions without having us at the table and also not only at the table because sometimes you see that you are at the table but then uh, you are you know like um, underestimated and also uh, this kind of uh, stuff and I'm also like someone <laughs> I'm trying to see the comments uh could you share some fruits of your work as a rapporteur some good outcomes hmm. yes uh as a rapporteur um as i said uh, uh when you work you see that sometimes very very small small uh details that might not seem as big is something that you're really very happy about and sometimes it's about just amending the text uh, in a way that you put there one sentence that was not there, you put there one paragraph which was not there, but finally when the text is adopted, you see that maybe those people who read, then they see that there is also another perspective. For example, in every in every document, when you see that there is this blanket uh, blanket approach towards everything and you put there that, you know, for example, in this case, COVID pandemic affected uh, um, everyone, but then gender, um, uh, women or non-binary trans people were affected in a different way. And then in this document, you explain in what ways um, we, uh, were those people affected differently. And then sometimes, uh, uh, for example, you see the text where like, uh, um, and enumerated some of the grounds and forms of discrimination, but they don't mention anything about uh, uh, sexual orientation. And you know that sexual orientation is one of the, uh, I mean, toughest and hardest topics. And you know that it causes most of the controversy uh, at the body. Uh, for example, in the Joint Council, where you see that there are state representatives uh, from Russia or from Turkey or Azerbaijan or uh, those states, not only them, but a lot others who, uh, uh, who might not have um, um, the same position as you have, like um, actually uh, opposite. And then you still somehow make to, you know, uh, agree together on a document that uh, has um, these different dimensions and ground there, still this is a uh, small victory. And also, to be honest, uh, as a person, as a queer person, uh, my major goal um, was not there 
uh, aiming, uh, I don't know, smashing uh, structures or whatever, just, you know, uh, achieving big, big things, like big for me. Uh, my main aim was to be there and talk and just uh, make people see me and like, look, um, I'm a person from Georgia uh, and I talk about gender fluidity and I'm telling you that, oh, you might want to like assume and see me only as a woman, but most of the time, I don't even know what you mean by, by woman. And most of the time, I don't know what I mean. And some of the times when I know, I don't want to be there. And then just being there and talking to them um, something is something that I might consider for me as an achievement because uh, uh, queer people um, lack representation a lot, uh, especially non-binary people. Uh, and then the issues that uh, queer LGBTQA community uh, is affected by uh, just uh, to be there in one-to-one -one discussion or just having their uh, workshop to, uh, like conducted to other members of the advisory council. Like for me, this kind of small steps mean a lot. And maybe this is why I, uh, I decided to put my resources there. Uh, I know that, uh, yeah, at these big structures, the uh, intergovernmental structures, um, things work uh, very slowly in a way, but they still work. <laughs> so yeah, and it's very important for us to be there. Are there any ways to penetrate this institution being outside of the structures? Yeah, mm. <laughs> the revolution, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, outside, we can do lots of things outside, uh, uh, lots of things. Um, uh, as a queer, queer feminist activist, uh, one of the, um, one of the, for me, like um, important ways of doing uh, uh, activism and changing uh, structures. First of all, starts by start by you know like reaching out uh, to people, creating uh, safer spaces where we uh, together talk a lot about our um, struggles and structural oppressions, and then. Uh, by reaching out to them and by mobilizing and maybe creating some force together that from outside will make them see that, look, whatever you're doing is not working. So um, most of the time that, that, that I use is just really like, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, when I came back to Georgia because I was abroad for a while, for my studies, I decided to really uh, get involved and establish really non-formal, non-hierarchical groups uh, because also op opposing some structures that can be ways of uh, disciplining us like these big institutions with uh, like establishment where those uh, well-educated, mostly uh, also rich men decide uh, and like slowly, 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 sometimes then taking into consideration some very important steps. The op opposite of this can be, yeah, um, organizing or organizing in non-formal ways, uh, non-hierarchical ways where there's no hierarchies, uh, no structures and just, um, you know, like uh, building something stronger. Um, you know what, most of the times when we, when we hear the word resistance, uh, what comes to our mind is going there with posters, uh, uh, you know, like um, organizing, marching, really, you know, going big. For me, resistance is not only that. Resistance uh, is not only being in the streets, resistance is not only uh, the way we believe uh, or it is shown, you know, in mass media or uh, the way it is done by being NGOs or the way it is that I believe in resistances, I believe in opposing structures, in 
sometimes very invisible ways that is not so visible to bigger uh, uh, public, not getting media attention, etc., etc. Lots of resistances are carried out. Uh, for example, in remote rural parts of Georgia where lesbian women get together in their rooms and talk about uh, uh, sexual violence that they have experienced and, uh, you know, empowering each other. And uh, this might not be the direct way of opposing or penetrating uh, the system that we live in that is in, uh, I mean, in different ways, uh, yeah, oppressive. It's not the direct way as such, but this is uh, for me, very powerful forms of resistance that we need to uh, think about dancing, <laughs> maybe dancing the nights away together uh, and uh, just holding our hands uh, uh, when we really need uh, each other. Um, I started to value this um, invisible and uh, often not so uh, and often uh, underlooked ways of resistance lately a lot and i think that that's where we should uh, um yeah start maybe or just be there i don't know my mind now went. <laughs> no um, thank you <laughs> yeah thank you no uh you yeah you also made like super important points also just coming outside of council of europe now and doing like grassroots activism and doing this as you were saying not a bit like invisibilized activism also just supporting each other and everything i also agree it's super important and uh yeah <laughs> uh my mind is also <laughs> going places i'm just uh, everything. digesting everything and <laughs> if I lots of different um yeah aspects and issues um, but uh when i speak about activism and resistance and we speak about it uh i don't see it being straightforward uh, and there's of course no straight answers to those things no no recipes or uh, no, this kind of, it's just, uh, um, again, me sharing what I feel, what I've experienced, what my struggles are, again, just uh, uh, coming from, from the grassroots and being part of um, big uh, structure. And also I'm there only like, uh, uh, I don't know, my mandate started uh, in March and pretty new to that. Uh, I hope that I will learn more, maybe get disappointed more or uh, or also see some more, uh, you know, positive steps, small steps, but still important steps. So um, it's all together. It's not really just, it, it, it's complex. It's always complex. And, we, and maybe we should, uh, yeah, see different angles of this complexity and, uh, um, appreciate uh, um, appreciate different different sometimes very small improvements but also in a way but always uh, the resources that we put uh, we should really thank ourselves because we're doing this it's also a very feminist act uh, to to realize and to be to be thank, thankful uh, towards yourself and towards your co-fighters towards those people towards those young people who, who put their, their, their resources on. If there are no other questions, maybe we can yeah, slowly close our discussion. Yes, um, I was checking Facebook. Uh, there are no additional questions. Uh, so yeah, we can close here. Uh, thank you so much, Mari. Mm -hmm. Really, this was also super inspirational, reflective, and yeah. Uh, thank you for your work. And yeah, people, don't forget to thank yourselves and stay angry. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> thank you for uh, uh, allowing me uh, to share my uh, experience and for uh, yeah. Mm, being uh, together with you. I wish you all the best and um, um, yeah, all the best in our uh, struggles. Yeah, let's stay angry. <laughs> <laughs>